Um, so this evening, I'm really happy to welcome you to our first in a new series of talks. It's called How to See the World. And this title is taken from a book about visual culture by Nicholas Miserev. And it has inspired us to consider this very question as we count down to our opening next year. This new series will aim to unpack our visual culture landscape outside of the museum setting, taking the city, our daily lives, and pop popular culture as a subject matter. Tonight, our talk explores making, and we have invited um, two different practitioners to talk about this, um, their ideas and their thoughts around this topic as, as um, deep sort of thinkers within this realm. So we're really excited to bring them into conversation with our lead curator of design and architecture, Iko Yokoyama. But before I bring Iko into the room, I'd just like to go over a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, if you feel like you want to, please turn on your camera. We are very tired of talking to a void and just looking at ourselves. So it would be lovely to see your faces if you wish. Second, we'll have a Q&A at the end of the presentation, which will last about 30 um, minutes. And so if you'd like to answer, um, enter your questions, please do so in the chat box and we'll moderate your questions and share them with the speakers. So now I'd like to turn it over to Iko and she will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Iko. Okay, uh, thanks Kelly for introduction and good evening everyone. And then thank you for joining us tonight. So I'm very excited to have uh, this conversation tonight with uh, the two artists uh, here, Annie Wang and Taeyun Choi, on the theme of making. We have been witnessing the tech culture embrace the new ways of creating and communicating, especially during soon ending entire 2020, we have spent so much screen time ever in our life. It seems and feels like the, that everyone can become a maker of objects, video, food, code, and even human connections. The idea of what we can make uh, has ex expanded from the craft something to more ephemeral. So tonight I would like to place the idea of making in this uh, contemporary context of digital culture and chat about the different facets of making and how an expanding practice can guide us in the way we live today. So therefore uh, we have invited two different artists, uh, Taeyun Choi and Annie Wan and they will uh, explain a little bit more their work, but I will quickly um, uh, introduce uh, their practice. And also the, the reason was that they have something in common, which is, a, uh, which is about um, the di a quite, the, their making is a quite different approaches, but they share common interests on the people's engagement in art and social value, and as well as teaching and via Zoom. <laughs> So uh, Annie, is a, Annie Wan is a Hong Kong based artist known with her ceramic works. Also as an educator and as an assistant professor at the Academy of Visual Arts and Hong Kong Baptist University. So Annie's work focuses on rethinking materiality and technique ceramics and its contextualization through process of making. And often by transforming the material, texture, value and meanings of everyday objects. She explores a form of art which are more engaging to the people and the community. Annie has uh, participated in numerous uh, exhibitions and the residencies program around the world and her uh, work has been in a collection of Hong Kong Museum of Art, uh, Hong Kong Heritage Museum, Burger Collection and the University of Sal uh, Salford Art Collection. And then uh, Taeyun Choi is an artist and educator based in Seoul and New York. His works cross fields of art and technology. It involves performance, electronics, drawing, and the installation that form the base of storytelling and the social practice. Tiyun is a co-founder of the School of Poetic Computation, artist-run school in New York, which explored the intersection code design and hardware and theory. We, uh, he believes uh, in the intersectionality of art, activism, education, and the works on disability rights, environmental justice, anti-racism. Through his uh, diverse practice, he seeks sense of uh, gentleness, magnanimity, uh, justice, and solidarity, and the intellectual kinship. So Taeyun's work has been uh, presented at New Museum, Whitney Museum of American Art, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, Van Allen Institute, Shanghai Viennale, Media City Seoul, Istanbul Design Viennale, and more. And he was also in our invited guest at our M Plus Matter in 2018, um, the art and design in the design, uh, digital realm. And then so, uh, so now without further ado, I will hand over to Annie. 
Hello, everybody, and good evening. So, um, because of the time limit, I I would just share two of my work, and let me share screen. So, because my practice usually think about um, how to explore the possibility of contemporary ceramics art, especially um, especially is the gap between um, conventional ceramics and also um, contemporary art. So the first work I, I would like to share with you is the road we traveled. And this is, uh, uh, first of all, I, um, this is a book about Hong Kong historical um, photo uh, photographs. They are black and white photographs. And, and then I use a black slip to, um, to, um, to put on every, to coat every pages of the work with this clay slip. So after I finish um, coating them and, and I put them into, I put it into the kiln and fire it. So the book, the paper, the book burns away. And and then um, in in the show, I will share um, the whole video with the audience. So the audience can see um, every pages of the, of the book and also um, the objects, the final objects of the work. So um, in this work, I, I just want to sh um, say that um, for the techniques in doing ceramics, actually we can explore more. So this is quite a uh, low tech way of making ceramics. It, it, so everybody can, can do it by just coating the book and with, uh, with a very, um, not very professional techniques, but actually is the conceptual approach to think about the ceramic work. And so this is um, close up, and you can see this is the clay slip. So another word is zhen, zhen ba fo. So zhen in Chinese means precious, and ba fo means daily, daily, of, uh, daily products. So there's kind of like contradiction between precious and also the daily cheap products. So in this work, I, um, I put some of the work, some of the, um, all, all these copies, they are mold, molded from the daily objects and they are now in Celadon. And, and actually it is not done by my own hands. I, I'm, I ordered it in Jindazhen. They, they are made in Jindazhen. So um, I put these objects aligned with the real objects in, in a store, in a store in an estate in Hong Kong. So uh, you can see all these ceramics objects are put around the real objects. I just want to blur the line between um, objects, like daily objects and also um, um, artwork. And at the same time, and I, I want to question about the value of the objects, like the art piece and also the daily objects. So how, the, how it can be like, exchange like um, in the in the monetary value and so this is I want to show you quickly that this is all the ceramics in in the shop in the store so um, that's another part of the work I put it in another showroom in um, in Shen, Shen Wan that is a like uh, area with full of gallery and also like cafe and high high end area. So um, I, I put all this work, all these objects in just like a showroom and but put it in like a gallery. But uh, finally, I was I I I would sell all of the work in the original price of the real objects. For example, one Coca Cola is about six dollar Hong Kong dollars. So. So you can buy the artwork with a very, very cheap, affordable um, value. So there's a queue of line, um, there's a queue of people, they line up in early in the morning to, to be a collector, one of the collectors. So, so every, every object, every art object is just gone in one, one and a half day. So, and at the buyer's home, I find it is quite interesting that um, I I um, I found these photos in Facebook on Facebook. So everybody just put it in the fridge and in the kitchen and in the bathroom. So not not treating it as like the ordinary art piece. They they rather put it in the, um, in the daily life space. 
This is in the fridge. So I just want to raise one question is, um, I, I did not make this ceramics by my own, by my own hands, but I ordered it in, in the factories. So um, this is the way um, this piece is made. So this is all I shared today, tonight. Thank you, Annie. Thank you, Annie. Uh, it's very exciting. So let's hear uh, from Taeyun's presentation first before our chat. Taeyun, it's yours. Hi. I hope everybody is well, uh, wherever you are. I'm in Seoul, South Korea, and I'm really happy that you've invited me to speak uh, to your friends and colleagues in Hong Kong and also internationally. It seems like you know the world is, has turned upside down since two years ago when I visited Hong Kong and was partying pretty late. Um, <laughs> anyway, so I would like to talk about a couple of the projects that I'm doing. Um, I'm a co-founder of the School for Poetic Computation, as Iko introduced, and I've been teaching and making computers by hand. And computers are essentially three things. It's a clock, it's an abacus, and it's also a notepad. It keeps track of time, and it does arithmetics, and it also remembers. And when I build these computers by hand, there's a lot of poetic imagination that comes into play, such as how the binary logic is essentially you know, manifested through electrical circuitry. Here's a drawing of an 8-bit random access memory. And you can notice like the patterns of abstraction and repetition that arise in these electric circuits. And I think there's a um, kind of the beauty in the sequential and combinational logic inside of computers. So the school invites students from around the world, and they are coming from the field of design, poetry, journalism, art, and technology. And we used to host 10 weeks intensive in New York, West Village, for these students. And things have changed dramatically since COVID-19 and other um, social and um, kind of important transitions in our lives and in our society. For this talk at M+, I want to talk about this concept of sympoiesis, which means to make wit, as opposed to the autopoiesis, which means self-making. I'm borrowing this term from Donna Haraway, uh, who writes in The Staying with the Trouble, Making Kin in the Chula Scene. Sympoiesis is essentially about interdependence and coexistence. And I found a painting that I made in high school, uh, roughly 20 years ago or so, and there was a beehive behind the painting surface. And it seems like the nature and, and my art has collaborated in that 20 years. On the left is the diagram of the symbiotic relationships in natural environment. And we can map the different types of engagement in the nature, such as the mutualism at the top, which is beneficial for species A and species B, all the way down to the competition, which is harmful for both species A and species B. And on the right, here's a diagram of the uh, suspension of poetic agency, which is different mechanics of poetic thinking and poetic delivery juxtaposed with the suspension of disbelief, which I think is a necessary mechanic for poetic imagination. And I make paintings, um, I still do, although I work with digital matters, uh, because there's a very, very beautiful experience of transferring an idea into a form, the material exchange of the paint, the canvas, and the brush. I've been thinking a lot about forest and habitat, which is an extension of a habit. So the environments that we create and the environments that we live in. And I've been thinking about making and unmaking those habitat because it seems like a lot of what we have done until this past year was about making spaces and making technology. But due to a lot of unforeseen circumstances, we are unmaking, we are unlearning, 
and we are uncomputing a lot of the things that we have taken for granted. And sometimes the paintings and electronics are juxtaposed, literally as a small computer that is serving as a local Wi-Fi network inside of the gallery walls. And inside of these devices, I created a little digital creature that is interactive in a way that you can, you know, play with these digital creatures. You can tell them what to do. You can let them carry a message from one phone to another phone. And in this case, I mean um, phones of the gallery visitors. So the message and creature from one device will travel to the other uh, visitor's device. And this is off the grid, meaning that it's not connected to the World Wide Web. It's just a localized, decentralized web. Here I will show a, a brief clip. Internet is a computer, just the largest computer that's ever built. And it's built by people. And people are not like machines. We have creative and political decisions which reflect our own identities and privileges. And I'm demonstrating a localized internet that I created with wonderful engineers, uh, friends, uh, Jonathan Dahan, Cesar Mokan, and Ye Hwan Song, who are pictured. And we tried to create a digital garden or a forest, possibly, where the uh, visitors to the Whitney Museum's um, performance space could actually interact. And this experience of creating a hyper-localized internet was really interesting in an age of uh, extreme connectivity. And this is just uh, in last year. And all of this is powered through a battery, which you can carry. And hypothetically, you could create these digital gardens wherever you go. The piece was about creating networks and decentralized and distributed networks. Uh, there's an important distinction there, which I won't get into today. But the piece ended up with a participatory experience with uh, about 100 people who are a mix of disabled uh, artists, uh, community members, as well as the museum visitors. And we created a kind of embodied network to imagine the future of the internet. I did a very similar performance at the M plus uh, Digital Matters two years ago. So all of these were very much embodied and about kind of f using physical spaces, physical bodies to you know, explore different types of network. More recently, I'm working with a wonderful organization in Hong Kong called the Center for Heritage and Text Heritage Arts and Textile, and we're trying. We've been trying to engage with the Hong Kong students to uh, share this message, and particularly working with the blind students in Hong Kong. So here is a really famous diagram of the different kinds of network, uh, different variations of internet. And I've been working with the chat team to produce an experience, an educational experience, where we can teach this and share this idea kind of in a tactile way. And again, this is right before the COVID-19. And I think things will take different shape as we move forward. But I'm still working with my friends to, to, to bring this idea remotely, but hands-on. So I think that's the key that I'm trying to share. <laughs> So the question for you is that how do you use internet in your daily life? In this workshop, uh, we use the word internet in a very broad sense. It means like websites, like Facebook or applications or apps like WhatsApp. So all of these are called internet. And just think about it as a way to tell the story about your network to your friends and family. And um, I think that's a great way to share what you want for the future. lines are. Yeah, so that's it for the presentation. Um, and I am very excited to engage with Annie and Iko and Carrie, and also all of you to talk about making and unmaking today. All right, thank you, Annie, and thank you, Taeyun. Uh, yes, I think it's for the audience, maybe you thought it's quite uh, very different approaches, uh, you know, for the, the both of them. But I see it's something really still, it's really common, it's both really address this analog quality. And then that's why we also, that's we kind of knew off from the uh, practice, and then also how they really engage the audience you know, as a little shop, so that they can come and see why you're buy, buy, buying Chinese cabbage, but you can also buy celadon cabbage as well, um, or, you know, the 
the Coca-Cola and so forth. And then even the Taeyun's one was a wonderful experience. He, you know, organized this uh, the, the workshop with us. We kind of connected with the thread. Um, so it is like always this uh, the the very real human interaction and tactility, both uh, with with how you interact with your outcome, but it's also under the process of making us very analog quality net. But so the challenge is like today in our COVID world and digital world, and especially you both really teaching. And then, you know, so that's a, such an essence in your quality of making how you communicate uh, with your art. So what is the kind of when we kind of losing the, our usual uh, sensitivity, locality, tactility, materiality, this physical information which we can usually rely on, and then with the, uh, the, the digital screen, it's diluted. So what in by, in by doing this, what are we losing? Uh, something behind or, or did you discover something new? We can kind of the discovery to that, um, you know, the journey, the translation, because it's both also that your work is often about kind of translation and transferring some meaning to the another. So when you focus it, you know, facing to this digital transmission, the screen based, what is your experience lately? Maybe Annie, do you want to start? So, um, because I work in ceramics, so um, ceramics uh, is about objects and not the material. So, um, and the meaning of making to me is quite literal and quite maybe conventional. It's, uh, it's about hands and, how, and also about material. So, um, if, uh, if just on the internet, just like what you said, um, we um, we do the making on, uh, on, on the internet. I think some of the material details are lost and also the three dimensional form will become quite um, reflectant like images. It's quite a lot of images now today. And, and also um, for me, material is still very important and it is one of the, uh, one of the issue will be lost if we just teach on, um, we, we, we teach ceramics on on site on like internet or something. So, so but uh, at at the other other side, um, it can reach more people. I think this is true. So, um, more people can learn ceramics, but um, but it's quite in the I would say it is quite in a superficial way of making in doing ceramics. So that's as well as think um, I'm not quite uh, sub, um, not quite supporting um, the all all the making on make uh, on the internet side. So mm -hmm. okay, all right. Then uh, Do you want to respond? Agree with Annie, but I will actually say that I was pleasantly surprised by how everyone adapted to the new normal rather quickly in the last six months. Like on the early weeks of COVID in New York, where I was based, um, you know, I, I teach in few organizations and like all of my bosses basically said like, okay, you have to teach online next week. And I was so upset because I was just like, like, what do you mean? Like, I, like, it just does not work. And like, I didn't prepare. I do not. But um, what I realized is that there has been a really positive kind of collaboration across different places. Um, so I taught a class about teaching and we had students about 35 to 40 people at different time zones. And we met in two different type, times of the week. So one for the kind of Europe and East Coast of the US and then the other for Asia, um, Southeast Asia, and then uh, West side of the US. And all the students actually, <laughs> we did a workshop called dal making, like an Indian dal food making, uh, led by one of the Indian students. And these folks in like Lebanon, like, you know, Malaysia, China, in US, like all, all making dal for one hour and with the ingredients that they found on locally. And they were tasting it by the end of the workshop. So it was still very hands-on and very visceral, 
So I think there's a, and it was just a really interesting way to think about, I mean, the workshop was about environmental, you know, impact um, of technology and also like other food, um, you know, food justice issues. But despite all of the challenges of time differences and teaching on Zoom, it was highly uh, hands-on and analog as well. So I think there's a possibility um, of actually utilizing the new normal to think about teaching and making and without losing the essence of what makes us human, what makes us enjoy the act of making with our hands. I get the both of you really um, touched upon, so it's still like the making is an, an activity, but what by hearing both of you is like what we are not, is that we are not sharing the outcome any longer. We are not like assessing like to touch and how it is, but it's actually really, you know, you're this doll cooking. Uh, it's very much about the, um, not so much about the materiality, not so much about the taste, not much about the smell, but it's just a common action together. So that's still really making. So the question is like, is the, so making can transcend the materiality. That's still like a kind of, you know, so which for you, it's both of you, it's very important, the very tactile, your drawing, painting, ceramic. But, you know, how, I mean, of course, this situation wouldn't continue forever, but, you know, the, yeah, so it's, I think you've been finding new quality. Um, that's very interesting. And then also, like, uh, um, yeah, I wanted to ask a little bit to you what you said about this kind of uncomputing, <laughs> you said, but because we are very much in this, forced to like spend more time with a computer so the you are always the, the saying like I'm computing unlearning it's a little bit like a yeah it's it is I get it but it's also a little bit contradictory because we are, have to really adapt ourselves to learning a new normal so it's not so it's so what do you what can you comment a little bit more this uh, uncomputing and unlearning during this time Right. I mean, I'm borrowing this word from Gayatri Spivak, who is a feminist philosopher, who talks about unlearning. In a way, it's not just about forgetting, but it's about asking and challenging how you learn, why you learn certain subject matter. Uh, for Spivak's case, it was a uh, you know colonialism and post-colonialism as an alternative to this um, you know pedagogical framework of the Western universities. But for me. Uh, I'm taking that to unmaking and also uncomputing because in traditional sense, people learn to code to become an engineer. And I, I have a lot of issues with that because I think engineering is or kind of a commercial uh, corporate sense of engineer is just the one type of technology. Um, there's a many ma like poetic approach, kind of a, activist approach and creative approach to working with technology. So for me, uncomputing is, is exactly that, is to ask why we compute, how we do it. And for example, how is the data being used and how is the code being used to govern the society? So it's giving um, everyone a chance to learn in a way that they can ask the right question. All right. Um, yes, it's, it's very much like how, yeah, how we adapt ourselves, and then also um, the yeah, it's it's very like how you say it, it's like uh, to adapting new normal. But at the same time, the, I'm very interested to hear from both you or both of you. It's this kind of the why are we gaining? We are unlearning. We are kind of you know coming to the new world. But at the same time, what what is the ability we are losing by doing this? Because you know you know that what's the joy in making. And then also I want to connect a little bit this question to the next one because it's, you know, we have seen the phenomenon in the, through the, all the social media, people started making things and just sharing, posting so much. And then I want to understand this, the, the psychology because, you know, you both are more professionally usually share your work, you know, in the gallery, in the museum, at the teaching classroom. But now people like amateurs, everybody started really sharing their what they made. It's not about if it's how it's made, what's the messages, people just sharing, look at what I made. So what is this kind of psychology behind, do you think? And then also what's the relation, you know, kind of little borderline between, you know, as a, you know, are you feel like a slatton a little bit, your profession as an artist and designers and then, because now everybody's embrace 
as a maker. Any? People like、um, other people to appreciate the work and they're making, and for sharing on internet, actually,、um, the response is quite immediate, and also is 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 spread out very quickly and and widely. So、um, like everybody like the like by by friends and 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 then it it is spread out very quickly. It's just like the depth of time is very thick. And it it is also lasts long long time. So, but it, sometimes it creates、um, more comparison between like people who makes things. So、um, if I have more like than you, and then I, I I might feel not very good at that moment. So so there's there's a kind of psycho psychological response you know, on like social media and.、So. Mm. And Taeyun, problem with people making stuff and posting online. I think they should do more of that.、Um, I, I think it's quite healthy and natural.、Um, I think I'm not threatened by other people making art and craft and posting online.、Um, but I, I think I'm trying to get to the core of your question. I think there's a danger of the sense of a consumerism. Associated with making and sharing online, that seems to be sort of undertone of what you're criticizing.、Um, I think there's a problem with that.、Um, I think there's a potential of kind of appearing to be creating something meaningful, but it's actually just consuming.、Um, been thinking a lot about waste and compost and kind of the, the circular approach of making. So if you're buying a lot of plastics and then making something nice and posting a picture of it just for the Instagram、um, appreciation, I, I think that's a very short-lived approach of making and sharing.、Um, but if you're making something recycled and kind of sharing that process, the joy of it, I think that's quite beautiful. I, I don't think why people should stop that. I totally agree. But at the same time, I also start to see. Because we had another event, our hackathon with the,、uh, you know, the very young,、uh, recent graduate,、uh, young people to look at what is the making and the personal museum, as a theme. So there is a, like a lot of like emotional anxiety in the society because you know, it's it's wonderful to see people what they make, but it's also become so much people start to stress. Oh, I'm not baking sourdough, or I'm not you know sharing like、um, starting any ceramic courses. So there is a little bit the balance between like making this become kind of psychological stress, but it's also what you also touched upon is like the because、um, I'm very 3D person. I love objects. I love tactility. So that's the kind of transition when it's become it's just a visual information,、uh, possibly audio information when we transmit. So then it's like a, it's it's kind of old-fashioned advertisement trick. So if it's like a, the the visual information. Because you have a, you, you don't you can't really back up with other quality. So like advertisement, you want to sell something, then of course you exaggerate. You try to look prettier than it is, you know. So then people start think that's the reality, you know, the things I'm going to get. But before, then you go to the store, you get the what you saw in advertisement, and oh, this is a disappointment. This wasn't really what I thought. But these circular things you you mentioned, Taeyun. So it was a little bit. If it's a normal advertisement, consumer products also any makes in object, there is a circulation to that. But today's we just sending out, you know. So because we never see those results, so that's a little bit like a,、um, the pattern. What I'm very curious of what's happening,、uh, you know, about our information sharing on the creativity.、Uh, but do you have any like you know you both、uh, encounter young people through your teaching? Do you have any?、Uh, Tip or recommendation how they can kind of a little bit psychologically relate to this,、uh, you know, making and sharing, and you know, get the feedback. It's amazing. Thanks.、Uh, you know, everybody wants to have a feedback. So how they can kind of relate in this moment? Do you have any tip? No tip. No tip. <laughs> I mean, I, I guess I'm just thinking about、um, for for some people, it's quite easy to post their sourdough or their painting on the internet. But other people, 
you know, think about it for four nights and then stress over the exact caption and the hashtag. And it, it just gives a whole a lot of anxiety. And I just know that it's not the same for everyone. Um, I think that it's quite similar to um, public display of affection of like some people love to show off like I have a you know partner like we are in love but other people are like you know I, I that's a private life I, I'm fully in love but I don't need to show that um, I think both modes of loving and making needs to be appreciated um, I think it's a little abrasive if it's enforced on upon people to show off your sourdough or your breakfast every day because I, th- I don't think people need to do that so just the culture of a more of a subtlety around what you make what you love what you create and i mean i also think the core of your question is about privacy so um i, I think we are at the a space of overexposure of like our personal lives and our creative practices so perhaps it's we just need to be more gentle about how much we share and how much we expect other people to either, you know, see what we post, hear what we say, or respond to our text message or Instagram messages or emails. To the audience, because I want the people to be making these wonderful things. So like it. So we, we, the question is, so like, is making can help to empower ourselves even through, you know, through screen, uh, you know, digital work. But maybe you don't have to share, but still you should just make things at home. But anyway, definitely this, the recent culture embraced, everyone is more encouraged than than there to make things and then to be also maybe even fail and not to necessarily make a very beautiful things or perfect things as artists can make. So, so how you can encourage maybe beyond your students, they want to be an artist. So maybe if you're normal people who doesn't, not necessary to be an artist. So how do you kind of encourage themselves about making? I think making is a kind of like self-expression. So um, uh, and also um, they in my in my like um, in my uh, understanding of the sense of making in ceramics, actually, is more like uh, a kind a, a period of time of concentration. So this kind of concentration actually can like you face your own self and also maybe some close to uh, meditation, something like this. So uh, it's somehow in this period of time, like um, the busy city in a busy city. It, is 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 kind of like um, play a distance between the daily life and and then you can um, find another way of express yourself in in the in the way of making. So, mm-hmm. yeah. so thank you, Katie, for the reminder. So we have got some questions. I think we do. So we open up the question to the audience. Yes. Yeah. And I think while I'm just waiting for the questions to load, I was just going to say that. Um, so I started making, doing some ceramics because I feel like I'm very typical <laughs> of somebody trying to get into making and I'm not very good and I won't share anything. But um, I feel like I was thinking like in some ways you just have to get over the fear of not being perfect and just because you're, do- you're doing it for yourself. You're not doing it for anybody mm. else. And I think for me that's like what I have to try and remind mm. myself. Mm. So I think it's sort of interesting listening to this mm. conversation because I think, oh yeah, what's stopping me or what's preventing me and that's. I have that same fear, mm. so I'm sure I'm not alone. Um, but I'm envious of people who are amazing at this <laughs> work. <laughs> okay, so I've got some questions now. Um, feel free to keep asking them because um, we've got a few minutes where we can ask um, the artists some questions. So I think um, one of the questions I'll start with, um, and I'll start maybe with you, um, Tayun, and then we'll go to Annie, which is, has your practice of making informed how you think about or deal with what's happening in the world right now? Oh. Is Zoom? <laughs> okay, so um, for, um, for me, I, I always think that, um, I always think about this, um, like the gap between uh, ceramics actually is a, like a studio, studio work. So um, it's quite different from um, now the digital world. So 
um, the nature of ceramics actually is like material and also like uh, objects. So um, if we change um, the ceramics into a digital way, it's totally changed the nature of the ceramics. So um, just like the 3D printing ceramics, so it doesn't need, um, you, you use the hands to work on the clay, and, but some, and also the way we try, like uh, we can, we can uh, send a 3D software to everybody and then they can print it out. So I don't need to make the hand, uh, make the objects by my hand and then I, gi I give um, to the presents to friends uh, face to face. So I think this totally like a revolution to um, the traditional ceramics. So I, I, I don't know, I am still thinking about how these two can be like um, merged together and also how this gap can be like filled up together with um, the com uh, contemporary world. Well, I, I would like just a quick comment. I mean, you've been kind of already doing, you said all this, uh, the Celadon object, you just ordered to Jindo Jam. So yeah. there is already, you start to kind of transmit, you know, like uh, passing on to, they can be, continue to be, they can just uh, click and order and then you send the order to China and then they will post it for you. So that's kind of circulation physically probably possible as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And also some, uh, one of my new uh, latest work and, um, People can buy, not not buy, adopt. I, I call it adoption. Adopt an hour on on internet as well. So I use the internet to to um like uh and to deliver to deliver the hours to the audience as well. What Annie just said because I I got a three D printer. 10 years ago, thinking it will be the future, I press a button and I'll have a teacup. But it was exactly the opposite. It was so difficult to print. And it was actually very hands-on. It was like, this motor is not working and the filament is not hot enough. It was very much about hand handicraft. And like the friends, like my artists who use 3D printing are so good at like understanding the heat transfer and like the materiality of the, the pigment, um, the filament. So, I mean, I think there's still a lot of the sort of the physicality involved with the digital manufacturing. So I, I'm still not sure, even if we order it to, you know, corporate uh, 3D printer, it's still, there's still a human operator in certain stage, as well as including like the delivery person who's carefully carrying this over the bubble wrap and then like placing it in, into us. So I still don't think the virtual has become totally immaterial. It's still very much like tangible in every aspect. Okay, so I think that ties into this next question a little bit because um, this um, questioner asked, does making have to be individual or, is it all, or does it also have collective elements? So does making connect us with other people in the world? Yes. <laughs> would, Annie, would you like yeah. to expand on that? How mm -hmm. does making connect us? Or is it, how does it, how is it, how does it feel collective to you? Mm, like um, the objects can be shared by people if it's functional, like functional wear. So um, the maker actually has the relationship with the user. So um, we, we, we sh they share the same, the same idea or um, they share the same feeling about the objects. So. Mm -hmm. When the COVID-19 became so, um, you know, dominant in March, April this year, I think everybody was making a face mask or the people who could sew were making a face mask and then donating to elderly or people who need them. I think that was just so beautiful. Like I'm, I just think like that time that they have put in to make that, like I think that's just so valuable and I loved seeing those images. So there was a sense of a connection through that act of making. And to, I think I was unable to answer the earlier question about if making has changed how I think about the world. Yes, because um, I still don't know what AI is, like the artificial intelligence. Like when people say machine learning or AI, like it's just, I, I literally don't understand. 
And I have a strong sense that people who say that don't understand it either. So <laughs> I've been looking into like kind of linear algebra and like the very basic kind of the mathematics behind a lot of the statistics. And I think I understand the 20% of how much I need to know to actually understand AI, maybe or more like 2%. But still that 2% actually helps me to have a better literacy and make an informed decision about what I say yes and what I say no to. So uh, yeah, I think the idea of making is not to like build a whole you know, house or your environment on your own. Right? I think that's not my personal goal, but just to have a different relationship with the ways things are produced and consumed and to appreciate them in different ways. Yeah, to, I mean, totally like it to you for making. So we've been talking very much about, you know, us or you, we make, but it's also, I think definitely this, uh, the COVID time made realize us, you know, the how things are made, how things are, you know, we suddenly a shortage of a toilet paper, a shortage of masks and shortage of food supply or air ventilator. So, so it was we are realizing the circulation of the objects, uh, which makes our life keep going. And then also how much actually can make it as a makeshift, uh, more temporary solutions. And that's also something which we've been heavily rely on automatically before. But actually we realized maybe we have to do a bit more effort to yourself you know, to more make things ourselves to, or maybe we cultivate, we bake or cook food, whatnot. So this uh, definitely was, uh, to me, was a very positive uh, idea uh, about uh, to facing this world because that was not only making ourselves uh, making things, but it's how all other makers around us make us our life going. Uh, I guess, uh, do we have- uh, We've got time for one more, more question. question. Yeah. Um, so I guess this is maybe uh, a good question for both of you to answer, which is, does making have to be useful? <laughs> and I think I know the answer, but I'll let you guys answer anyway. Tell us what, why you think that way. So, um, and also what, uh, what's the meaning of useful as first? So um, if it's functional, um, I think the process of making is already a very useful way of expression, so um, but the object itself it doesn't needs to be functional. So, mm -hmm. well, the I think there's, yeah. Sorry. Um, I I think there's a lot of power in uselessness and the lack of utility. Um, I think as long as I guess. I want to pose the question back to the audience is, yeah, useless making is beautiful and we should continue, but making of the waste and excess is also problematic. Like we just produce so much stuff, like the whole world, including artists. <laughs> and so I think the question is like, how do we make in a way that is ethical, beautiful and meaningful without excessive uh, production? And I still ask that to myself all the time as I make stuff, yeah. That's a very good uh, note, Taeyun, because that's the kind of, I wanted to kind of also reach to the, our, you know, we're embracing, but we have to think about the meaning of making, you know, because we are surrounded already so much objects and so many things. And then we have to think, you know, if it's, if it, you know, maybe it's better to help the other, your neighborhood baker, by buying bread also, that can be a good action as well. So it's, I think maybe, I hope we have been kind of encouraged and learned and also maybe a little bit after this talk, maybe we reflect a little bit once maybe you buy a, like a, yeah, the, the kit, what you make or, or maybe not, or buying somebody else made stuff. So I hope this will be just a little clicking your mind, uh, you know, when you go on the street and you go to the market next time. So shall we conclude? Yes. yes. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for audience. And, uh, and again, sorry for a little bit technical, uh, so a little bit delay in the beginning, but I hope you could hear our conversation through. And then thank you, Kerry, and thank you, Annie and Taeyun, and then also whole team here at the MPLAS. Uh, maybe you want to continue to say something yes. of this series? Yes. Yeah, so um, stay tuned. We'll be launching the next series. We'll take the next talk will happen in January. So um, just 
watch the M Plus um, channels and you'll find out what and when that is. So thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Eco. Thank, thank you, you. Tayun and Annie. Thank Bye, you. Bye, everybody. And thank you all for joining us. Thank you.